Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to the service of South Swansea Baptist Church this morning. Would you stand with me, please? I'll draw your attention to the screen. We're going to start out with our opening hymn, Reach Out to Jesus. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Got those voices all set, ready to go? I'm only human. I'm just a man.
Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. And the morrow may never be mine Lord help me today Show me the way One day at a time Do you remember When you walked among now than then cheating and stealing violence and crime so for my sake teach me to take one day at a time one day at a time That's all I'm asking of you Just give me the strength To do every day What I have to do Yesterday's gone Sweet Jesus And the morrow may never be Well, this morning I was listening to the news, and I guess the Church of England, is it? They want to change the Our Father <clears throat> because, yeah, they want to change a lot of the words because it's offensive. I tell you, it's not getting good. <laughs> but we're not changing anything that's in God's Word, whether they like it or not. Amen. Stars of the night Walk my Savior of light In the garden of dew Let it breathe When no light could be found Jesus knelt down the ground Father's own son As he knelt Neat the old Olive tree All the sins Of the world On my Savior Was hurled As he knelt In the garden my 
white Savior alone on his knees. Not my will, thy be done, cried the Father's own Son, as he knelt neath the old olive tree. As he knelt neath the old olive tree. Amen. Well, amen. It's good to see you here this morning. Well, there's some folks not on vacation this morning. Amen? amen? And I'm looking at you. It's good to see you. Amen. All right. Well, listen, we have um, several announcements we want to make this morning, so I draw your attention to the bulletin. And if you look under the announcements sections, of course, you see the various ministries of the week here. But under the announcements, this coming Wednesday at 6 o'clock, please mark your calendar. This is July the 12th at 6 for VBS prep and songs meeting in the fellowship hall downstairs. So if you are going to be helping out with Vacation Bible School this year and would uh, uh, we'd love to have you come and participate in this meeting the next few Wednesdays right up to Vacation Bible School, they'll be meeting together, doing prep, song decorating, doing all the things that need to be done to bring it all together. It's going to be here soon, Vacation Bible School, Keepers of the Kingdom, which will be that Monday through Friday, August the 7th through 11th from 9 a.m. to noon. And we really covet your prayers uh, for that time. That's this coming Wednesday. I do want to remind you about this Saturday, we have our church picnic at Colt State Park. And keep this announcement as a reminder for you in your bulletin to attend our annual church family picnic there beginning at 10 o'clock. And we also have some instruction here that we will be located at sites 4 and 6 just beyond, I believe there's a, what's called a bocce ball court right there on the right. And you can also watch for the SSBC banner uh, as you near the sites you can bring your hot or cold foods and snacks. We will be supplying the beverages and the watermelon. We do that each year. We look forward to having you come. So we pray that we'll have a good weather day on that day. It's uh, basically the same site that we've been at for the last, I don't know, um, almost 40 years, I guess, we've been at this site. 
And uh, it's a beautiful site right there along the water, and everybody is invited to come. And so that'll be this coming Saturday at 10 o'clock. I do want to remind you that following the morning service today, if you're able to stay with us at 945, we have our FBT, which is our Fellowship Bible Time. Love to have you come. We have a men's class up here. We have the ladies' class downstairs, young people next door. And then also, uh, let me see, this coming Wednesday at 7, um, while the group is going on with their Vacation Bible School prep, we'll be having our Bible study and prayer time up here. Love to have you be a part of that. And then Friday at 4 o'clock, uh, there's a deacons meeting. And let's see, I think that is all that we have in there for those announcements. So let's take a moment and let's pray for our offering. And then as soon as we do that, we're going to have the Galileans come and sing one more song for us. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, that we can come and worship you in this place that has been set aside for the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. And Father, I ask and pray that you would bless the offering that is given today in this the plate up front and the plate in the back. Lord, uh, we thank you for the opportunities to give a portion back to you through our tithes, offerings, love gifts uh, that you've given to us. We also thank you for the opportunity to support our missionary families, uh, some in this country and a host of them uh, overseas in foreign lands. Thank you for the missionary support financial support that comes in to aid them, assist them in the work uh, that you've called them to do. We ask and pray that you would bless our service today, work in us, that you might work through us, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name, for his sake we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. At this time, Galileans have another song for us. How are we doing, Tom? Hey, has anybody in here has hang on? Has anybody ever had QC Quinetics done? Well, it, instead of having knee replacements and and all kinds of joint problems uh, operations, they get this QC Quinetics. They take your blood, they spin it. And they take stuff out of your blood, they inject it into your knee, so I'm going to try it. I'll let you know if it works. <laughs> hey, the insurance don't cover it. That's the bad part. It's like 5000 a knee. My wife said go for it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. If I come in on a walker, you know it doesn't work. I am the fool with fearing strangers while traveling to this world below. Yet there's no sickness, toil, no danger in that bright land to I go I'm going there to see my Savior to sing his praise forevermore I'm only going over Jordan I'm only
and no the clouds will gather around me I know my way is rough and steep yet beauty is fears that just be for me where all the saints their vigils keep I'm going there to see my Savior to sing his praise forevermore I'm only I'm only go when over home. I want to wear a crown of glory when I get home to that bright land. I want to shout. Salvation story Ink next with blood The old blood land I'm going there To see my Savior To sing his praise Forevermore I'm I'm only go when over home. I'm only go when over home. Well, Bernie, I have an idea. Pam will extract your blood. I'll shake it. <laughs> She'll put it back in and we'll, 2,500 bucks. We'll give you a deal. That's it, we'll give you a deal. I can't run fast, but I can run around the block. I'll shake it for you. There you go. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen, for that song. Um, just before we begin, a couple of prayer requests to share with you, and then um, we're going to open up our Bibles into Matthew chapter 7 this morning. Continue to be in prayer, if you would, for Brother Bouchard, Jerry Bouchard, and the Kimwell Nursing Home. Some of our folks at home watch the service. They're not able to be here with us. Jerry, Gertrude Aguiar, Jerry Bedencourt. Roger Bouat, continued prayer for his health. Uh, Bob Gillette, this is Marie's husband. He suffered a stroke last Wednesday, I believe it was. He's in the hospital, uh, partial on his left side, affected a little bit of his speech, uh, going into a rehab, looking for a rehab facility to help him with that. So be in prayer for Bob and for Marie. Uh, Peter LaCroix for his continued healing. Bev Oliver, home. Roland Petit, his healing. Armin and Sue Ramos for their health. Uh, Brother John Tippins for his health. And then, of course, for our church missionaries. We want to remember to continue to be in prayer for those, not only in this country that we support, but also those that we support around the globe for their safety and um, for their continued ministry of the gospel through their churches. And then we have a, a word of congratulations here to Adam and Megan Arujo on the birth of their son, James Adam. And James was born on 7-8 at 4.22 in the morning. He weighed in a healthy 8 pounds, 5 ounces, 21 and 7-8 inches long. So we congratulate Adam and Megan also. 
Uh, Megan and baby James are doing well. We also congratulate grandparents again. Ray and Joyce do so. Now this is number 14, right? Number 14. And so in a, in a couple of years, we'll be congratulating them on number 20 or <laughs> poor Joyce just fainted. But uh, praise the Lord for that. And healthy, healthy. You've got a, saw the picture of uh, little James, and he's just a cute little bundle, that's for sure. And uh, so we are so happy for them and continue to pray for them now um, as they get to bring him home soon. We look forward to that. Matthew chapter 7 with you this morning. Matthew chapter 7. Our lives are going to get a little bit back to normal. My wife and I, we had uh, all of our family come out, our three daughters and our son, and uh, our three daughters, their husbands, our son and his wife, and um, the grandchildren. We don't have 14. We're behind that. We only have 11, but that's good. 11's a good number. And, um, but we got to stay... Uh, around the home and they came out and wanted to vacation out this way they'd like to do that every every few to a several years if they can where they grew up and so they headed out some of them left Thursday some Friday and my son and his wife leave today and so we pray for their traveling mercies as well and now the uh, we need we need we almost need a vacation from their vacation <laughs> You know, and I say that in a very loving way, in, in case they tune in, you know. But uh, it, it, it was great to have them, and we just, you know, my wife was in her a grandma element, you know, with all the grandbabies around, and not all babies now. They're not babies, but uh, that was a lot of fun. Matthew chapter 7, one verse this morning is what we're going to focus on, and this is where we left off last time as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount with the Lord Jesus. Verse number 12 Jesus said, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. What a different world it would be if we applied that every day. To our lives what would our families be like if we applied that what would our churches be like what would the business atmosphere be like if we applied that have you ever found yourself in a situation faced with the need to make a decision on the spur of the moment and wondering what is the right way to act i mean you're in that position and for that moment you're unable to recall whether the bible specifically addresses the moral dilemma in which you find yourself. And that can happen to us. It happens to each of us at one time or another. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, I believe, provides a helpful tool for us. And that's how I see this. It's a helpful tool for us for such a situation. It's quick and easy way to know what to do. And it's also something very, very easy to remember. It's not complicated, remembering this verse. And this is the verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. And it's commonly referred to, do you remember, often referred to as what? The golden rule. The golden rule. And again, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. But what is actually the golden rule? I mean, this is one verse we're going to look at this morning. Is there enough to address what the Bible says here for us to meet here this morning and take a look at this? Well, of course there is. We'll be here, we'll be in other passages in the Word of God. But what we notice here, uh, when the question comes up, what is the golden rule, we often follow that up, was, was Jesus teaching anything new or original by what he stated? And I think about that. Was he teaching something new? In a way, yes. Was this an original that really isn't so new? Well, in a way, yes. So I'd like to take it from that vantage point. And, and share with you this morning as we talk about Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 12. So let's, I, I think we just have a few main points with you this morning and we're done. But first of all, uh, I call it the golden rule versus the less than golden rules. The golden rule versus the less than golden 
rules. There are an awful lot of rules out there. And there are an awful lot of rules that we often attribute to the Bible that aren't rules in the Bible at all. But we look at this golden rule, which is often referred to the golden rule. And, and I, I was doing some research, and I realized that many have taught that which is similar to what Jesus said. Notice I said that which is similar. Not same, but that which is similar. The Hindu religion taught, this is the sum of duty. Do not to others, which if done to thee, would cause thee pain. This is the Mahabharata out of the Hindu religion. The Buddhist religion taught, hurt not others with that which pains yourself, Udana Varga. The Jewish tradition taught, what is hateful to you, do not to your fellow men. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. That comes from the Talmud. The Muslim religion taught, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself, and that's found in the Hadith. But there's also a couple other sources that I found interesting. Uh, Confucius, you remember him, Confucius, uh, he was in the time period of 551 to 479 BC. He said, what you do not want others to do to you, do not do to others. Isocrates, a uh, period 436 to 338 BC said, do not do unto others what angers you if done to you by others. And then finally, Seneca, 4 BC to AD 65, he stated, treat your inferiors as you would be treated by your betters. And there's a whole long list of teachers and individuals of higher learning and philosophy and so forth. They all have their little take on this. They all have their spin on this. And I mention that to say this, that Jesus' rule that we see, this golden rule that we read in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus' rule is slightly different. Jesus requires his followers to do something favorably to others, while the others we just quoted to you, each of these, from the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Jewish, the Muslim, Confucius, Socrates, Seneca, and a whole host of others. These others that we quote only prohibit one from doing un something unfavorably to others. So here's the difference in what Jesus has to say as opposed to what others have said. According to Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus shifts the statement from the negative to the positive. The negative rule was fulfilled by inaction. For instance, the inaction, the negative rule, not bothering others. Don't be a bother to others. But the positive rule requires from us that we carry about an act of benevolence, that we are to carry about an act of benevolence to those we come in contact with. Oswald Chambers asks, what would we like other people to do to us? Well, Jesus would say, do that to them. Don't wait for them to do it to you. And isn't that really the meaning behind a benevolent factor that we have? That's the meaning behind the benevolence that the Bible carry, calls upon us to carry out and to live. I don't have to wait until somebody blesses me to bless them. I don't have to wait to treat somebody kind, uh, treat me kind, before I treat them kind. What I need to do, what I learn as I read the Word of God, and especially if we've been going, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, we need to let the Holy Spirit of God stir our hearts. We need to let the Holy Spirit of God work in and through us as to the things that he would like us to do. And, and in fact, if we allow the Holy Spirit of God to have his way in our life, isn't he the one who guides us and directs us and encourages us to live the things we're supposed to live? Isn't he the one that when you would see somebody with a need, the Holy Spirit of God pricks your heart to help meet that need? Isn't he the one that when you see somebody going through a tough time, the Holy Spirit pricks your heart and says, why don't you go to them and see if you can render any assistance to them? See, that's what we see here in this text. Uh, we could also say this, you want love, then what do you do? Love others. You want love, love others. You need prayer, what do you do? Pray for others. You want credit for having generous motives? Give credit to others for their generous motives. You need a friend? Be a friend. 
You see, this is what the Holy Spirit of God would lay upon our hearts. The Holy Spirit makes us picture what we, uh, what we would like other people to do to us. And then he says, now go and do this to them. See, it's a whole lot different than all these others that we just mentioned to you. They had more of a negative take on this. Jesus is more positive in the fact that this Matthew chapter 7, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. It, it has an active benevolence on our part toward others that we come in contact with. And I think some of that's missing in society today. In society today, it, it basically falls into this. What can you do for me? You do something for me, then guess what? I'll do something for you. Or you do something for me, then guess what? I'll think about doing something for you. If I feel like doing something for you. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, do to others what you want them to do to you. Others said, don't do to others what you don't want done to you. And there's a difference there in those two phrases. Others required that you don't harm other people people. Jesus required that you show kindness to others with no thought about harming anybody else. You just do to them what you would like done to you. So Jesus' rule, I guess we could say here, it is truly the golden rule. In other words, the others are less than golden rules of value yeah, they can teach us something, but not as much as gold. So in one sense, Jesus taught something new. Think about that. Compared to what many teachers had taught prior. And yet in another sense, what Jesus is saying here, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, in his Sermon on the Mount, it's really nothing new at all. In fact, in this, we see how Jesus gives us a guideline for righteous conduct toward others. And that's really what this is about. How do we treat others? How do we treat others properly? Especially when we see what's happening in, in today's world and we don't see proper treatment of others anymore. It's like, um, it's like common sense is gone. You ever thought about that? Somebody had a funeral for common sense and I wasn't invited. But it's, it's just gone. You know, this holding a door for somebody, speaking a kind word. And I'll tell you what, though, when you come across it, it's a breath of fresh air, isn't it? When you come across it and somebody speaks a kind word or does something well, that's a breath of fresh air. So a guideline for righteous conduct toward others, Jesus lays out here, it is one in harmony with the law and the prophets. This is what he says. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law of and the prophets. And as we've seen earlier in Jesus' message in Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 through 48, Jesus taught us standard of righteousness. What was the standard of righteousness? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, you remember this, this is back now when we began. Jesus said in verse 20, For I say to you, Matthew 5 20, that unless your righteousness does what? Unless it exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus taught a standard of righteousness that contrasted with the scribes and the Pharisees, and yet it remained very much in harmony with what the law and the prophets revealed. And in fact, we can say that this one rule summarizes for us what the law and the prophets was all about. Just as the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, summed up the law as taught by the Apostle Paul. Take your Bible and look at Romans 13 just for a moment. I want you to see this. In Romans chapter 13, let's look at a statement that Paul makes under inspiration of God, Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Paul says, beginning there in verse 8, O oh, no man anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore, 
love is a fulfillment of the law. And so what do we draw from that? Well, Paul said in Romans 13, what we see Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 7, to me, and when I think about this, it's kind of like a pocket knife or a carpenter's rule or a mechanic's wrench. It is something that is always ready to be used. Owe no man anything but to love one another. We are to implement that every single day of our lives. Jesus said here, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. We're to implement that every day of our lives. In everyday life or in any event or the event of an emergency, when there is no time to consult a friend, when there's no time to sit down with a teacher, when there's no time to text somebody, no time to get the phone call, no time for the book of, a book on advice on how to do it, no time to grab your Bible and start digging in saying, well, listen, how do I really handle this? The golden rule Jesus sets forth is a guide. It is a guide for us for proper conduct in any situation that we face. But think about it. Whether it, that situation's at home, it's in a church place, it's in the work environment, something happens, something occurs, what do I do? How do I handle? That's what we said at the onset this morning. What do I do? How do I handle when I find myself in this situation? Well, you know what? Apply the scripture to your life. What's the scripture? Let's, right here before us. Whatever you want men to do to you, do to them. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. You want to be treated kind? Be kind. You want love? Be loving. You want to, you want to grace? Be graceful. You want mercy? You say, but what if they're not? Doesn't matter. It's on you. You can't let somebody's action, it's action and reaction. You can't let their action control your reaction. How do you react when somebody hands, hand, handles you a certain way, a particular way, comes at you a particular way? And I think there are some examples of how to apply this rule as I see it in the Word of God. Let's look at the example in teaching the law. So imagine what it would be like to be told, you're wrong. How do you say that to somebody when you're seeking to be a witness? Hey, you're living a life of sin. How do you say that to somebody when you're seeking to be a witness? Wouldn't you want to be told in a loving and patient spirit, it, it's true, if a person is wrong, they are wrong, and we present it in a very loving, kind way. If a person is lost in their sin, we want to see them come to Jesus? Yes, absolutely, but you present it in a very loving and kind way. Do you remember the Bible in miniature? John 3, 16. For God so hated the world, right? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the attraction. That's the draw. It's the love of God. And there has to be that contrast. We know what John says the world is all about. But we also know what the Bible has to say in reference to what God and his love and his grace and his mercy are all about. So what do we learn here? Everyday life, every event, the golden rule can be our guide for the proper conduct and situation. The situation, for instance, in teaching the lost. As you would have others try to persuade you to repentance, so treat those you desire to introduce to Jesus. Do you remember the first time somebody talked to you about faith in Christ? Remember the first time somebody began to share with you from the word of God? They didn't beat you over the head with the Bible. Don't go around beating other people over the head with the Bible. Just live it out in a very kind and gracious way. Listen, Jesus said it. Whatever you want men to do to you, do to them. I like in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, 
The Bible says, and a servant of the Lord, and that's what we're to be, serving God, living for God, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So what does he say? As a servant of the Lord, not, no quarreling, no fighting, no argumentation, gentle to all, be able to teach, be patient with people, in humility correcting those who have an opposition. And God grants them repentance so that they may know the truth and come to their senses, escaping the snare of the devil. What a wonderful thing that is. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. He says to them, he says to them, but speaking the truth in love, that you may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Who is the head? Christ. But notice how he starts that? But speaking the truth in love. There has to be something different from, between us and what the world would do out there. The verbiage has to be different. The thought process has to be different. The mannerism has to be different. How we carry ourselves has to be different. It's very, very important. Some of the examples how to apply this rule, not only in teaching the lost, but how about in correcting one another? How about our encouragement to one another? No one likes to have their mistakes. Errors, shortcomings pointed out. Do you like that? When somebody comes up and, and they just start haranguing you about your mistakes? You like that when they come up and they start going after you about your errors or your shortcomings? No, nobody likes it. I would much rather hear, hey, good job, rather than, oh. When necessary, wouldn't we prefer to be approached with a meek and patient spirit? Well, this is what we find as we look at the scripture. As you would have others offer you constructive criticism, so offer it to them in a very loving and gracious and kind way. In fact, I like what Paul writes to the church of Galatia. We've said this verse to you before, but I think it bears repeating here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on to the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Paul almost just imitates through his verbiage what the Lord Jesus said. If one is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on to the right path. And you know what is in our mind as we think about what Paul said? Treat others the way you want to be treated. You see, that's the golden rule. That's a rule for us to live by. And that's something, like I said, you don't have to walk around with a whole case of textbook on you with all the study and all the advice and, and, and text this and study that and find this. No, just learn to apply that to your life in every given situation. It's very important. Example of how to apply this rule, not only teaching the loss and correcting one another, but in treating our family, our neighbors, our enemies. Everyone likes to have loving families. Everyone likes to have good neighbors, and everyone would like to have no enemies. But applying the golden rule will not only transform ourselves, but it also transforms those around us. Can you imagine, could you imagine living a life where there's no such thing as sibling, sibling rivalry? Imagine what that would be like, or neighborly squabbles, or enemies becoming friends. I guess what I'm saying here is don't limit the application of the golden rule to just spiritual matters alone. Treat your neighbor the way you want to be treated. Treat your family member the way you want to be treated. And that person that I don't know, they, they don't have much good to say about you. Well, don't act in kind. But apply the Matthew chapter 7 rule. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. It's interesting to me, too, here, where Jesus said, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, 
do also to them. There's this interesting word, therefore, which suggests the golden rule of this verse draws an application from the preceding verses that we already looked at concerning God's gracious and loving provision, right? And you say, where do you get this? Well, notice, if you would, in fact, going back even further, we go back to Matthew chapter 5 and beginning in verse 17. Some of these headings here that Christ is a fulfillment of the law, murder begins in the heart, adultery in the heart, Jesus forbids oath, go the second mile, love your enemies. And it, it just goes on. It goes on where we see the opportunities to make the application of this one single solitary verse to the entire message of his Sermon on the Mount. Now, let me just wrap up by saying here, I like what English minister Joseph Parker said. He was a minister during the 1830 to 1902, and he made this statement. He said, the golden rule would reconcile capital and labor, all political contention and uproar, all selfishness and greed. And such would be the impact on our society today if more people followed Jesus words. I'd love to sit down at my internet and open up and see it splash across the page. No bad news this morning. No wars or rumors of wars. Everybody's getting along. Leaders are getting along. Politicians are looking out for your best interests. Churches are preaching the word of God across the nation. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is being spread. Revival is coming into the land. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? But I suppose first we have to start close to home. And the golden rule has to transform our own lives. And those closest to us. Oswald Chambers, once again, he said of Matthew 7.12, he said, Matthew 7.12 is our Lord's standard for practical ethical conduct. Now think about that. It's the standard for practical, ethical conduct. Preacher, what do I do? How do I do it? This is what they've said. This is what they've done. This is how I'm treated. This one verse right here, I'm convinced, would take care of all the bullying in the world. Right here, if we just apply it to our lives. And if parents and grandparents would apply this to their life, when their kid come home and they say, I was bullied, rather than the father saying, well, listen, you go back there and knock their block off. Hey, how about treating them the way you want to be treated? I mean, that message will sink in. Dean of American Poetry, his name is Edward Markham, he was around the period of 1852, 1940. He stated this, and I like this. He said, we have committed the golden rule to memory. Let us now commit it to life. And I think this is what's true of many, isn't it? We know the rule, but it's living by that rule. Now, how many times you hear people say, well, I know what the Bible has to say, but it's one thing to know what the Bible has to say. It's another thing to implement that knowledge into your life, make it part of you, and to live that out. And we're not talking about the whole Bible here. We're talking about one single solitary verse. But God can help us to do that. And he will, by his spirit, help us to do that very thing. If Jesus is truly our Lord then we need to allow, we need to permit this golden rule, if you will, to govern our life. Every aspect. You say, well, I, I'm going to try to put that, I'm going to try to put that into practice, but what if they don't, what if she doesn't, what if he won't? Well, it doesn't matter what they, he, or she do or don't do. It's what about you? It's got to start somewhere. It's, Lord, let it start with me. God, help me. God, show me. God, teach me to apply these truths to my life. Scottish minister John Bailey, I quote him a lot. I enjoy him. Uh, in his book, it's called A Diary of Private Prayer. 
he writes this. He says, quote, May that light and joy and power keep my thoughts pure. Keep me gentle and truthful in all I say. Keep me faithful and diligent in my work. Keep me humble in my opinion of myself. Keep me honorable and generous in my dealings with others. Keep me loyal to every cherished memory of the past. Keep me mindful of my eternal destiny as your child. End of quote. How is it possible? Well, first, it begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Knowing your sins are forgiven, heaven your home. Two, after coming to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, it comes about as we get into his word. His word is a love letter written from God for us for today. And it's getting in that love letter. And it's reading it and meditating on it, and, and, which means just to think about it. Think about it. What God is saying and what God wants to do in our lives. And then making that application, making it yours, owning it, making it to be a part of your life. And this is one of these verses in this great Sermon on the Mount that you and I can make to be a part of our life as we seek to live for God. Preacher, what do I do in this? What do I do in that? What if this happens? Make this your default. Make it your default. And so Jesus said that whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Do also to them. Can you think we could do that together? I'm sure we can. Young people, all people, men, women, all of us. It's a good reminder to us how we are to live our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking to be a witness to all. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity again for us to gather ourselves in this place. Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the truth that's imparted into our lives, into our hearts, into our minds. And Father, as we spoke just briefly this morning on the subject of this, what many call the golden rule, I pray that you help us to examine our own hearts and our own lives seeking to employ this truth to our lives and to help us to live it out. And yes, even in the midst of the challenges. Sometimes it may be difficult, but we always know that it's biblical to follow after you and what you teach us in the scriptures. We thank you for each one that's here today. Father, I pray that if there's one or more this morning they have listened to part of the instruction of the sermon from Jesus, but they don't really know him in a personal way. Oh, they know him in their mind. But they've never come before him seeking forgiveness of their sin from the one who died on the cross for them that they might, through him, who conquered both death and the grave, that they might, through him, know for sure that they can have a home in heaven. Let them speak to us this morning and speak to somebody here, one of our men, one of our, if it's a woman, one of our ladies, as we would love to take this book of life and to share its wonderful truths and how we can not only know Jesus in a personal way, but that how we can grow in Jesus and learn more about him each day and how to live his teachings out so bless us, we pray. Give us safety as we travel to our homes today. Be with us throughout the day on this Lord's Day. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, for his grace and sake, we pray. Amen.